these two terms first is locomotion and movement is there a difference between the two or is it just same biologically to begin with what do you think because then i'll be able to tell you the difference if there are any or not so what do you think Aram? what do we mean by locomotion versus movement and yeah they both are same but mm -hmm. they're not exactly the same yeah so in what uh, scenario they're not exactly the same according to you Uh, in locomotion, there is no displacement of the body, whereas in the movement, there is. Mm, I think you, you are just saying the opposite. Okay. So, locomote, the word locomotory organs are always the organs in an organism that helps the organ to change position in space. Okay. So, locomotion is associated with changing position in their space in the area where they live okay whereas movement can be just a movement of the body for example movement of my hand so this is a movement it qualifies as a movement of my body but does not qualifies as a locomotion make sense so we have joints we have muscles that help everything in our body move so if i clench my fist i'm moving my fingers but i'm not locomoting okay is it is it clear you know? yes yeah so locomotion is uh, uh right down let's start with this basic fundamental definitions hello Waziha. Waziha has also joined in how are you doing mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay good great so as i said write down locomotion is a voluntary movement of an organism voluntary movement of organism that leads to change in place or location of, of the organism okay whereas movement can both be voluntary or involuntary for example um the movement the peristaltic movement okay that happens in our intestines of the muscles that is an involuntary movement the movement of our lungs okay that's involuntary movement most of the time we don't pay attention to it correct make sense Iram? yes yeah so we don't say locomotion of the lungs or locomotion of the intestines it's movement of the lungs movement of the intestine movement of the heart etc so it can be voluntary or involuntary movement of organs okay in an organism so biologically the word movement uh, can also be uh, so for example uh, you know that there are stationary organisms like a uh, uh, sea anemone mm -hmm. so sea anemone is fixed at a uh, substrate right and it has it has tentacles correct mm -hmm. so these can move based on the water current right they show a movement to catch prey and predator but this organism itself is fixed so it is not locomoting but it is showing movements of all kinds okay So, in a movement may not lead to change in location. Okay, make sense? <coughs> mm. 
Make sense, everyone? Bazia, Iram. Okay, great. You can you can give me a hand, thumbs up. Also, just be just be interactive in some of the other manner. Great. So we got locomotion, we got movement clearly. So now onwards, in biological terms, when I'm talking about locomotion, just know that it is a movement that leads to change of place of the organism, which means this movement is voluntary done by the organism for some reason. Okay, that is in organism's control. Most of the time, for locomotion, the reasons are either finding something, right? Either finding food, finding a mate, or finding a habitat or a safe place. So for these three reasons, organisms mostly locomote. Whereas movement can be due to a lot of reasons. For example, to digest our, uh, we show peristaltic movement, our blood keeps on moving throughout the body. Okay, So for nutrition allocation to every tissue and cell, uh, we show movement. Uh, we also show movement of our bladders, movement of um, hormones through blood, lymph in the body, movement of the eyeballs. That's also movement, right? Movement of all our joints, all our limbs. That's also movement. But all sorts of biological movements may not lead to change in place. Those which lead to change in place are called locomotion. Cool? You will remember this? Great. Now, building on this, this is clear, but the point is there may be a functional difference between these two, but when it comes to bi like the basic level of, of biology in as, at the level of tissues and organs and cells, they're not very, very different, okay? And we'll discuss how and why. Before that, let's talk about what are different types of movement, okay? <clears throat> so for, to, to talk about types of movement in biology, there are all sorts of movements that organisms show. So if I say, if I ask, what are different types of movement? You have to ask me in what context this question is being asked. Because if I'm talking about unicellular organisms, they move more or less just like how cells in our body move, except for the fact, uh, part where bacteria can also use uh, flagella or paramecium can also use cilia. Okay, so when we talk, when we say types of movement, we have to define at what level of life we are talking about. So let's say I'm giving you a level, and the level is a cellular level. What are the movements at a cellular level, like the cells of a human body? Keep us keep cells of human body in mind, and tell me what type of movements can they show. Any cell in human body that you know that it shows any kind of movement, it can be a locomotory movement also. Because at cellular level, and anything that moves stays in the body. But it changes location in the body, right? So if the, I talk, yeah, tell me, tell me. Yes, Zero. WBC shows a me body type of movement. Yes, great. So one example is WBC and you used a very, very WBC also known as leukocytes and used a very, very correct and technical term that they show amoeboid movement. What is an amoeboid movement? The movement is not fixed. The movement of? Can I say through, um, through pseudopodia? Yes. Like projections. So the cell should have no fixed shape. 
and let's say this cell wants to go in this direction so this cell will first put two pseudopodias or more pseudopodias in that in that direction and then will shift as a cell like right, from its earlier position correct and then again it will show another pseudopodia and will shift in position right so throwing pseudopodia like projections getting a uh, getting a hang on a substrate and then move correct that's called amoeboid movement also uh, waziha has written a very good point muscles just one word would you like to elaborate waziha what do you mean by muscles do muscles also show movement they go from one can the so wbcs for that matter can go from my head to my leg through blood right they keep moving they also keep moving in in search of viruses and bacteria what about muscles do muscles also move yes sir yes how how do they move so can the muscle of the hand go to my leg or my abdomen because when we do any work then our muscles are moving na yes you are correct like i i completely agree with you that they are moving but how are they moving what kind of movement is this like do they go from one place to another in the body or what do they do what kind of motion is that voluntary yeah it is voluntary but do they move like wbcs so my point is the muscle in my in my arm let's say here in my forearm there is a muscle right and you are saying that it is moving when i am lifting something or moving my hand it is moving but where is it going is it going from the arm to the wrist or to the biceps or to the shoulder what is how is it moving one hint is uh, if you have, if you have seen anyone flexing the biceps so when they when they stretch their hands the biceps are relaxed or contracted so they are relaxed they are stretched and when they bring it back it gets it gets contracted and you show is you see a bump in in the in the in the um, arm right so this is the shoulder and this is the biceps do you see that this kind of a bump is there in the arm versus when it is open like this is when it is in, in not it's like bent i'm so bad at drawings but what i want to show you is that you will see that there is a bump in the muscles when it is bent correct you understand what i'm saying versus when it is straight you will not see that bump right and so something like this when it is straight correct so from this position to this position when it goes how are these muscles moving is the question you are correct that muscles do move but what is this kind of movement called so they show contraction and relaxation movements okay is it clear so no position is being changed it's just the contraction and relaxation but all type of cells do not have this property all cells cannot contract and relax so muscle cells have something special and we'll study what is special about muscle cells that allow them to contract and relax like a elastic okay wbcs cannot contract and relax for that matter or rbcs but they can show amo amoeboid movement so you write down muscles first write down about wbcs write down some specialized cells in our body some specialized cells in our body like 
leukocytes and macrophages like leukocytes and macrophages show amoeboid movement show amoeboid movement and what component of the cell helps in this kind of movement if the question comes then write down the cytoskeletal microfilaments the cyto skeletal microfilaments so let's break this word down cyto means cyto come on cyto is simple right cell cell skeletal means we have a skeleton so what does skeletal means framework okay just like human body has a shape and that shape comes through the bones of our body every cell has a shape even if there is no shape they also can change the shape okay so the shapes that cell can change or attain is because of the cytoskeletal uh, elements in the cell and these cytoskeletal means uh, the elements that give framework to the cell and they are there are one type of cytoskeletal elements called microfilaments micro means small and filaments means wire like structures so these structures help the cell to be fluid and move around so the amoeboid kind of movement happens due to cytoskeletal microfilaments through research it has been shown that if you somehow perturb so there are drugs that dis degrade all these microfilaments so if you use that drug on a leukocyte or a macrophage and degrade all these microfilaments from inside the cell the cell's movement the cell will not be able to move okay make sense everyone so yes yeah. so where are macrophages present in the body they are present <clears throat> mostly so they are muscle resident also tissue resident so in different tissues interstitial tissues these these macrophages keep wandering so there are tissue specific macrophages like there will be macrophages which are wandering in the liver tissue they are hepatic macrophages they'll be in blood they'll be in different other tissues so they keep moving from one place to another like policemen and mostly they clean the tissue okay so be because in the tissue what happens is many a times antibodies can't go or wbcs can't go so these macrophages go there okay so you can write down macrophages are tissue uh, sorry tissue specific and they keep the interstitial regions of any given tissue clean if they find any uh, bacteria or any pathogen any any antigen they try to just engulf it and destroy it okay make sense yes yeah so for amoeboid movement cytoskeletal microfilaments are responsible this is important okay now coming to muscles so what do you think is important for uh, this is called muscular movement also contraction and relaxation is characteristic for muscular movement all our muscles whether they are lung muscles intestine muscles all these movements that we have seen where something is not moving from its place but it is at one place only but it is showing some kind of movement that's called muscular movement okay and for for example our limbs our jaws this movement is also muscular so you know so from the uh, there is a mandible and the maxilla so the upper part of the head which is fixed where our eyes are noses and the upper cheekbone is that is called maxilla we cannot move the maxilla we can only move our mandible which is the lower jaw 
upper jaw is fixed in the skull there are some organisms that can move both lower jaw and upper jaw you know like snakes so basically they can open both the jaws to 180 sorry yes 180 degrees alligators on the other hand can move the upper jaw you must have seen alligator when it opens it opens the upper jaw have you seen okay so in our case yes was yeah i can repeat my micro uh, we i'm so there are two things macrophages and microfilaments what do you want me to repeat there is nothing like microphages there is either a macrophage or a microfilament what do you want me to repeat Azia are you there yes yeah. sir the second one microfilaments no the other one my macrophages yes macrophages sir yes macrophages are uh, kind of they help in uh cleaning or they help our body fight against antigens and pathogens they engulf the pathogen or antigen and kill it destroy it they are they are big cells they are big cells and they live in tissues okay they keep wandering in tissues they show amoeboid movement like your white blood cells the difference between a white blood cell and a macrophage is that white blood cells only stay in blood sometimes they leak and go into the lymph okay but macrophages are tissue specific they are present in different tissues of our body okay they also do the same thing they keep moving see any pathogen bacteria they will engulf it and degrade it is it clear macrophages yes sir sir yes. i have a question mm -hmm. microfilament and macrophages comes in a cytoskeleton no macrophages are cells just like wbcs microfilaments are present in every cell that shows amoeboid movement any cell which is capable of moving on its own okay by changing the shape like amoeba you have seen right in textbooks at least you know about amoeba amoeba moves by changing its shape throwing pseudopodia and then moving forward right so this diagram that i have made here this is a cell which will have a nucleus and it will show this so this is called pseudopodia why it's called pseudopodia because pseudo means false podia means feet or appendage so it looks like it has two legs on which it is walking or using which it is crawling but these are just the extensions of the cell okay so that's this kind of movement is called a amoeboid movement you understand was here and this movement happens due to this component of the cell so these cells have microfilaments which help them in move okay is it clear was you okay great good so we're talking about muscles yeah so right down so our jaws tongue all our muscles etc uh, they they move through muscular movement so you can write down muscles or muscle cells so the cells of muscles are called myocytes okay myo means muscle and site means cells so myocytes have contractile property myocytes have contractile property and movement of muscles movement of muscles enables 
the locomotion of an organism. Okay, so muscles themselves cannot locomote. They can just move at their place. But due to that movement in their place, our organism can locomote. Okay, so when we are walking, the muscles in our leg are there in the leg only. Okay, so that is a, a contractile movement. But we can move because our leg muscles can contract and relax. Whereas if you compare that with the blood tissue, blood in the leg will go to heart, come back to leg, go to hand and everywhere. Okay. So contractile property of muscles enable locomotion of an organism. But it is not just that locomotion can alone happen because muscles are contracting and relaxing. Correct. What else do we need to move from one place to another? Is the contraction and relaxation of leg muscles enough? Bones. Bones, correct. So be these muscles has to have to attach to something rigid, which gives framework to our body. So yes, it's bones. And what do we call the do bones also move? No, they don't move, but they help in movement. No, they do move. If they will not move, how will muscles move around them? That's why we have joints, no? So at this joint, the bones are moving, right? I am able to move my hand because my my bones can move. Can you see? Right? You can see, of course. Oh, yeah. So every so in my finger there are two joints, three joints. Okay. And there are muscles all around that bone. So there are two kinds of muscles that join the body together. One is called ligament, other is called tendon. You know what is the difference between a ligament and a tendon? You must have heard, you must have heard of ligament here and tendons. So ligaments mostly attach muscles to muscles. Okay. Or muscles to bones. Those are ligaments. Is it clear? Muscle to muscle, muscle to bone is ligament. Tendon is bone to bone. So tendons are mostly uh, concentrated at the joints of the bone. So wherever there is a joint where two bones need to be attached together, there will be tendons. Make sense, people? Uh, okay, great. Just one moment. Muscle, bone, or muscle to muscle. Tendon is they connect bone to bone. So they are attached to bone on one side and the other bone on the other side. And how to remember it? Tendons are white fibers. They are white in color. They are whitish. Whereas ligaments are kind of yellowish, reddish. Okay. Makes sense. <clears throat> Makes sense. Okay, they want yeah. Great. Now, so one thing is we need skeletal muscles as well to move, but Again, my question is, to locomote, do we just need a skeletal movement, which is the movement of the bones, and the muscular movement? Will these two help in proper movement? Let me give you a hint. When a baby is born, a human baby, it has muscles, it also has bones, and both can move. The baby cannot move very effect efficiently. It learns how to move over time. Why is that? There is something else needed to move 
properly something that controls our movements and it is located yeah tell me iram not sure but i can look is it medulla it is it is neurons it is brain in in general right we need neural co control and coordination to move yes or no yeah so for locomotion three things are required right on one is muscular movement second is skeletal movement and third is neural coordination if any of these three is affected you cannot locomote let me give you example you must have heard of muscular atrophy a disease where muscles degenerate right if the muscles of the leg degenerate then you won't be able to move even if your brain is acting your neurons are okay and the bone is okay you won't be able to move correct when muscles lose energy someone who has fatigue or a muscle cramp they have the neurons working they have the bone okay but still they cannot move okay muscular movement is hampered if you have a broken bone muscles are fine neurons are fine still you cannot move correct because these two have the weight bearing capacity together third is neural coordination have you heard of paralysis nervous paralysis the muscle is okay the yes. bone is okay it's just that the there is a injury in the brain or in the spinal cord and that the leg cannot be controlled by the brain or the spinal cord so even with intact muscles and intact bones you cannot move okay make sense thumbs up if it's clear good so these three are required together for locomotion to happen in humans very well okay so muscular is done amoeboid is done anything else anything any other kind of a movement that cells can show there is one kind of movement again how do uh, how do movements happen in in paramecium let's say how do paramecium finds food there is something called ciliary movement you know about cilia if i have taught about cilia and flagella right yes yeah so this is called ciliary movement and the best example is a paramecium but in human body also ciliary movement takes place can you tell me where does ciliary movement takes place track yes <laughs> our internal tubular organs all the organs which are tube like in our body they have ciliary movements of substances happening because they have these um what do you say they have projections like finger small small projections called the ciliary uh, yesterday i think in the last class only we were talking about some cells in the kidneys the bodal epithelium that has this kind of arrangement on it right remember yes so what what does this arrangement helps in what do they help increases in? surface area yes increasing the surface area is one along with that they also help in movement so anything which has to move like fallopian tube it is a tubular organ again in females how does ovum moves in the fallopian tube 
because there are these small um, uh, philopodia like cilia like structures that push through the motion push the ovum from one point to another so their movement will lead to movement of substan substances so that's called ciliary movement is it clear so down most of our internal tubular organs most of our internal tubular organs are lined up by lined up by <clears throat> ciliated epithelium a good example given by iram is our trachea so what is trachea associated with what does trachea want to do in our body through its ciliated epithelium what does it want to move so these cells don't move anywhere they stay at their place but what what do they want to move air yes but can't air go inside on its own do you need to push air to move inside the lungs we learned that air can move inside because of the pressure right so there is a negative pressure in the lungs um as compared to the atmosphere so air rushes in when you breathe in but there is something with air mixed that we don't want to go we don't want our to, to get inside our body which is dust so the ciliary epithelium helps in the movement or removal of the dust particles from the air okay so you can write down uh the coordinated movements of cilia coordinated movements of, of cilia helps helps in helps in okay uh, you can write you can also write it like this coordinated movement of cilia first in trachea so let me give you two examples in trachea helps in removal of inhaled dust particles inhaled dust particles and in fallopian tube helps in directed motion of ovum okay is it clear great so these are the three kind of movements that can be shown at cellular level amoeboid movement muscular movement and ciliary movement now at a organismal level if you think locomotion is majorly happening through muscles right out of this at a organismal level we don't movement does not happen through cilia except for some uh, unicellular organisms like paramecium movement is also not happening by amoeboid movement except for amoeba which is a free living um, 
protozoa. They can also be parasitic amoeba, parasitic protozoa. They also move through amoebiasis. But in most of organisms, higher organisms, movement happen through muscles. So we'll study muscles in detail. But there are also some exceptions in human body where movement of uh, cells does not happen through ciliary movement also, does not happen through amoeboid movement also, does not happen through uh, muscular movement also. Can you think of something which we recently have discussed? So let me introduce here one more kind of movement which is not very well defined in your books, in your textbooks, but it is a kind of a cellular movement. So cilia are very small, fine fine, fine hair, right, on the surface, correct? But if I ask you, with what mode do sperms move inside the female tract? Is it ciliary, muscular, or amoeboid? You will realize that it does not fit in any of the category, right? Yes or no? Yes. So how do sperms move? They have a long tail which resembles a flagella, right? And they beat it in a whiplash kind of a motion. And the neck region of the sperm has a fixed number of mitochondria lined up. In a human sperm, that number is between 50 to 75. Somewhere this, there will be mitochondria lined up and they will provide energy to this tail to do this whiplash kind of movement that's called flagellar movement. So this is also a mode of movement that at a cellular level, Cells or even some organisms also exhibit this, like euglena. You know about euglena, people? You must have heard of euglena. The long tail like thing. Or chlamydomonas. So euglena these, is familiar. Yes, euglena is like a cell with this kind of a tail, right? So to move, it beats its tail in a whiplash motion and it moves ahead in what? Similarly, the sperm moves. Right down, a flagellar movement helps in a swimming-like motion. helps in a swimming like motion in human sperms and unicellular organisms like euglena. Okay. And so this is all kind of cellular level movement that organisms or cells can show. Now, apart from this, as I told you, mostly it's muscle based. So movement in animal kingdom is muscle based. So let's talk about muscles. Now, what are muscles? <clears throat> In our body, in a human body, around half of your weight is muscles. Okay. So around 40 to 50% of human weight is because of the muscles. 
and what are muscles mainly composed of? In other words, the question is, what is chicken or flesh a good source of? Proteins, right? They're a good source of protein. So muscles are composed of proteins mostly. On the other hand, if you talk about hepatocytes, uh, they are mostly composed of glycogen because liver is the place where we can store glucose in long chains of glycogen. If you talk about fat cells, they are mostly a good source of lipids. So they are composed of big, big vacuoles where lipids in a bilayer or a monolayer or a multi-layer arrangement is stacked over one another and stored as fats. But muscles are kind of pure sources of proteins. They utilize glucose. They break down glucose, make ATP, use that ATP to contract and relax. So glucose does enter the muscles and muscles are so efficient in breaking down glucose that they have their own globin system. So muscles have, just like blood, blood has hemoglobin, which has a high oxygen carrying capacity because blood reaches to every part and provides oxygen to the cells. Blood cannot reach each and every muscle. It tries to, but it cannot. Sometimes muscles are so densely packed in our body that, so muscles have their own globulin system that is called myoglobin. Myoglobin, just like hemoglobin, has a very high tendency to bind to oxygen and supply oxygen to these muscles so that they can utilize that oxygen to do oxidative phosphorylation of the glucose and provide lots and lots of energy because muscles need lots of energy. Now, when you are running, you have to channelize all your glucose into the muscles. Otherwise, you won't be able to run. And to break down all those glucose, you need also to channelize lots and lots of oxygen, which hemoglobin alone cannot do. And myoglobin has a higher affinity. If you will see the curve, the oxygen binding curve and the oxygen dissociation curve of myoglobin versus hemoglobin. Myoglobin, so remember that curve we talked about? We did circulatory system, we talked about a curve oxygen dissociation curve, right? So this was saturation, O2 saturation, and this was time, right? Or hemoglobin. If you look at myoglobin's curve, it will be more steeper than hemoglobin. So it saturates faster. It has more affinity to bind with uh, oxygen and you can understand why because they deal with muscles. Muscles need a lot of energy. Okay, so these are just gen general facts that you should know. Apart from that, there are, so what are the properties? I'll write down some characteristics which has asked. So this question is from boards. Yes, sorry. Mm. Write down. <clears throat> What are the characteristic properties of muscle cells or myocytes? So one is <clears throat> so first property is excitability. Muscles are excitable. What do we mean by excitability? Muscles are always in connection with neurons. That's called neuromuscular junction, NMJ. And why they are always in connection with neurons? Because whether the movement is voluntary or involuntary, whether it is under your control or whether it is not under your control, it is under brain's control. So brain has voluntary centers and involuntary centers. For example, 
signaling from the brain can alter the movement of your gut muscles so when we feel very very anxious when we feel very like afraid fear the the feeling of fear pain anxiousness panic it elicits muscle contraction in our body especially in the gut so people who are very very um in shock or anxiety sometimes puke or vomit because of the involuntary movement of the gut okay or the feeling of disgust also sometimes so someone if you see like sometimes people see very um, like you see a dead animal then you you are not very good looking at degraded dead animals so people do puke it's not because of the smell it's because just by the sheer sight of it it elicits a a disgust response in their body and the muscles undergo involuntary contraction but it is under some or the other center of the brain's control so first thing is all muscles are excitable you can just excite it with small amount of current and for this we do not need to just and there are only two kind of cells that work on current in our body one is the heart cells cardiomyocytes and other are the neurons so neurons can send a signal to muscles which when they send a signal to muscle to get excited the muscles take a lot of calcium inside calcium is a positively charged ion and movement of any kind of charge is known as a current it, it gives rise to a small amount of current in the muscles and muscles get excited you will feel uh, excitability of muscles if any one of you has got a shock electric shock a mild electric shock or a static electric shock which is very common during in winters any one of you have experienced a electric shock yep devangi has me too so how did you feel wherever you got that shock mostly it's hands because we humans are curious or we do things we touch things and we get a shock right so how have you felt you feel that for some time your muscle in that region feels numb correct yes sir yeah that numbness is because that sudden electric shock was way too much for the muscles muscles got so much excited and they contract in response and that that what that is what leads us to withdraw our hands at a lightning fast speed we don't even realize what has happened but before that our you know we just retract our hand as a reflex but we feel that muscle of that region feel little numb because they have just lost a lot of calcium in that contraction uh, process also if any one of you has i don't know if you have experienced it um if you get a very freshly freshly uh, cut chicken at home you know a freshly cut leg piece of a chicken or any muscle piece which is intact so the muscle should be intact in that piece of flesh and if you put some salt on it just a pinch of salt you will see that the muscle will move anyone has experienced that even if you put a salt solution on a dead frog which you have freshly dissected and it's it has died just now you can excite the muscles the muscles don't die instantaneously you know it takes some time for every cell of the body to die when a organism dies so many muscles can be excited excitable even after death this experiment was used by you know uh, how many of you have heard about alessandro volta so the first kind of devices like a battery which can store charge so the the experiment that they did to show that these uh, these uh, compartments of copper can hold charge is to take a dead body put a wire in the muscle okay of the hand and then switch it on and you will see that muscle will suddenly start moving and it's like the person has come to life 
but the person is dead. It's just the muscle that are still in an excitable state. You know, and that was a kind of experiment done in history. So if you read the history of physics, it is very much associated with biology. And you will realize that charge and electricity was discovered in this way. Okay. So first is excitability. Second is upon excited, upon um, once excited, they should have the ability to contract and relax. That's called contractibility. Whether it is a heart cell contract contractility, contractibility or contractility, both are correct. Third is they should be able to bear stress upon extension. So if you extend a muscle, it should be like rope. So every rope has some weight bearing capacity. That's how our muscles work. And that's why we are able to do pull-ups okay, or push-ups for that matter. So when we, we are doing pull-ups, basically the muscles in our shoulders and the hand are in a fully extensed state, like just like a rope. And they are bearing the weight of the body. So stronger the muscle, you can train that muscle to be more and more extensive. So third is extensibility. Right on. <clears throat> extensibility. You cannot expect extensibility from neurons or from epithelial cells. Okay. So so that, that's the reason that our skin cannot, you know, they can bear stress, but not as much as the muscles. Okay. And fourth is elasticity. Elasticity simply means once extended or once compressed, muscle cells have the ability to come back to its original conformation. Okay. Is it clear? So under force, it will bend and then it will come back to the original conformation. Just like a rubber band. So these are the four properties of muscles. Clear to everyone? Any doubt in this? Great, cool. Now, let's come to classifying muscles. Classification of muscles. You know how many total muscles are there in the body? It's not in your book, it's just a no, fun fact. There are fixed number of muscles in our body. Anyone knows how many? Around 600. Okay, these are muscle groups. So not individual. So muscles are always classified as fibers. Like cables. So if you see from our head to the toe. There are around 600 muscle groups. That's all. To be very specific, I think it's 640, if I'm not wrong. But yeah, 600 something number. Okay, now right down. Muscles are, so whenever the rule of biology, whenever you classify anything, there has to be a basis of that classification, right? We learned that in classification of organisms. So muscles can be classified on the basis of their location. Muscles can be classified on the basis of uh, function. And muscles can be classified on the basis of structure. Most of the time, the structure is associated with the function in biology. Okay. Now, going by this, 
criteria of structure and function, we can classify muscles into three types. One is skeletal muscles. Okay, these are the muscles associated with the skeleton, with the bone. I talked about ligament, tendons, all these are skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are voluntary. They are voluntary muscles, which means that the neuromuscular junction that these muscles will have, so their connection with neurons, those neurons will be going to a part of the brain from where you can send signal. For example, muscles of your legs, hands, neck, all the muscles which you can move by will are skeletal muscles or called voluntary muscles. Is that clear? Yep. Okay. Second is, we'll go into the details of all, but let me just broadly tell you about. Second is called um, visceral muscle is a good term. Also known as, in books, it's called as smooth muscles, smooth involuntary muscles. But the good term is visceral muscles. They are present in the viscera. I, remember I told you every organ has a muscular layer, whether it's tongue, heart, liver, kidneys, they have muscular bladder, urinary bladder, our sphincters, intestines, trachea, okay? eyes, all these have muscles. Okay, These are visceral muscles. Most, they are involuntary. Mostly. Okay? They are not under our voluntary control. Sometimes they can be mixed. Like they will have some voluntary component and up till some point um, and that point is decided by physiology and the function. After that point, it becomes involuntary. And example of that is the sphincter of the urinary bladder. So that is a muscle which has both the components. We can control it till some time. We can get trained to control it better and better, but we can never control it forever because after one point of time, maturation, the urge of maturation just happened. And people, if they try to hold their urine for a very long time, they may end up peeing the pants. Simple, because that's where we lose the voluntary control of it. Uh, other sphincters are completely involuntary. For example, our um, uh, gas, e esophageal gastric sphincter, it's, we cannot open it at our will. It always opens up when, it, when the body knows that there is a food that we are going to ingest or during a vomit reflex, it opens. Okay? Similarly, the, the sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine is again involuntary. We cannot open or close it at our will. Make sense, everyone? So it can be completely involuntary or it can be partially invo involuntary. But most of the times, it majorly is involuntary. The visceral. Third is cardiac muscles. Now, we keep cardiac as a special category because of some mixed features that it shares with visceral and also with skeletal that I'll tell you about in some time. So cardiac muscles, but mostly these cardiac muscles are involuntary if it comes to the function. The features that it shares is different. We'll talk about it. So we can never control the beating of our heart. So heartbeats are a, are a major criteria to assess a lot of physiological and psychological conditions because if you want to increase your heartbeat, you cannot increase or decrease it at your will. It always requires a signaling from the brain either or um, the AV node or the, S or the SN node have to work on their own. Okay, but mostly it gets affected under a feedback, whether it's coming from your hyperactivity or it's coming from a psychological fear or panic or trauma or anxiety, anything. 
cool so clear till here yeah now let's start writing few important points about all these three first about the skeletal muscles write down as i told you they are closely these muscles are closely associated with the bones or the skeleton and these muscles are also known as striated muscles you know what does the word striated means striation strip like appearance yes strips like appearance so if you see these muscles under uh, a microscope let's say then you will always see some dark bands and some light bands striations in the muscles okay and we'll talk about why these striations comes up but they have these striations that's why they are called striated muscles <clears throat> and so you, third is they are under voluntary control that's that you understood and you can say that these are the primary locomotory muscles so this is a neat question which has come up which has which has been asked right on skeletal muscles are the primary locomotory muscles not visceral not cardiac but they are not the ones which use the most energy can you guess which one uses the most energy which among these three uses the most energy which is the most energy consuming muscle under normal physiological circumstances it is cardiac okay anyone has any doubts why is it cardiac if no then give me a thumbs up cool <clears throat> but the major locomotory are skeletal and also it is responsible for body posture again obviously and then come to visceral muscles write down these are present in the inner the inner inner walls of hollow structures and organs inner walls of hollow structures or organs in our body so all the tracts that we have all the pipes that are laid in our body okay they have these visceral muscles any pipe from pipes in the lungs to pipes in the digestive system to pipes in the reproductive system to pipes in the what else circulatory system all these pipelines which are also known as the um, tracts all these tracts have visceral muscles <clears throat> and they are called smooth muscles because they do not have any striations okay and they are involuntary mostly as i told you and you can write good example for these muscles is the muscles that show peristaltic movement to move food the muscles that um 
gives the urge to defecate okay so muscles of the large intestine muscles of the rectum muscles of a uh, urinary bladder all so yep yeah so i have a question yes please uh skeletal muscles also consume a lot of energy right like movement walking or maybe running yeah right so um if someone is an athlete training for like you know hours and hours a day you will see that skeletal muscles are consuming a lot of energy but even when we are asleep when our legs and hands are barely moving our heart is beating all the time so if you sum up a 24 hour utilization of power utilization of energy and also remember when you are running it's not like muscles are using energy and heart is not heart is also speeding up so it is also using more energy than before so the baseline so that, that's why when we say these things or these question comes in the question they say that which of the following muscle group consumes the most power under normal physiological uh, conditions okay so in general the muscle that is that 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 works the most is the eye muscle in a human after birth okay eyes also move in sleep so eyes constantly keep moving so the muscles in the eyes that's why by the time someone reaches 40 50 60 years of age eye muscles get weakened they have to get weak weakened because the ciliary muscles in the eye are working throughout so even if you are not you know very explicitly looking at things and for even if you are currently when you are looking at words on the screen you're looking at uh, my image and i'm i'm dangling my hand you are trying to focus on my hand your eyes muscle are constantly working so after birth it's again it was a aipmt question that which muscle works the most and if there is a eye muscle in the option you have to choose that it it works even more than the heart muscles throughout the day but if there is no eye muscle then it's the heart muscle and it is always normalized to the size of the muscle now to compare between a eye muscle and the voluntary muscles of your body of course your eyes do not have as many muscles as your legs have correct so of course they will take lots of energy and combined together as i told you that 50% of our body weight is muscles out of which our voluntary muscles are the most abundant so it's obvious that they will take up energy but do you understand in what context i'm saying it is the in, it is in context of the working regime how functional some muscles are yes yeah like your your voluntary muscles can rest but your heart cannot rest your eyes cannot rest so even when you are sleeping if you are thinking that your eyes are resting it's not true there is a state of sleep called rem sleep you know rapid eye movement sleep a sleep in which we dream it is a state of sleep where our brain is as active as we are when it is as it is when we are awake so in rapid eye movement sleep your eye muscles constantly keep moving because you are dreaming okay does that answer your question era yeah yeah it's, it's very it's such a it's such a interesting thing that so and and interestingly i happen to be doing my phd on sleep behavior so rem sleep is actually so so opposing to the concept of sleep in organism that is it is called a paradoxical sleep a sleep which is not like sleep at all so our canonical notion of sleep is our body is at rest only the involuntary things are working our brain is resting eyes are resting that's not true okay <clears throat> now let's come to cardiac muscles right down
first of all the cardiac muscle cells which are called cardiomyocytes they form a branching pattern so they are branched muscles okay and they share both characteristics so if you take a heart muscle sample of any organism and you see it under the microscope it will be branched and there will be striations so they look like striated muscles but they are not voluntary they are involuntary so cardiac muscles are striated but involuntary that's why they are studied separately yeah. they are also very unique group of muscles where the contractibility is so high and these muscles don't tear off they don't wear and tear and they don't uh, fail very soon so if i ask you to keep running for 10 hours a day your legs will cr get cramped your leg muscles will hurt it will be sore there will be lots and lots of lactic acid deposited in your legs your heart has been beating since you were like a couple of months in the womb of the mother and it keeps beating till the end of the life there is no lactic acid deposition there is no fatigue wear and tear of the heart so it's involuntary but it is striated cardiac muscles are actually very very interesting muscles and about human beings the human cardiac muscles cannot be regenerated but there are many organisms in uh, especially fish and some higher organisms as well after fish also where like amphibians where heart muscles can be regenerated back so humans can only regenerate their heart muscles in in embryonic stage that is also not very well studied till what point because studying a human embryo is not ethically allowed but by other embryological studies of mammals like mouse we know that mouse a pup a mouse embryos can regenerate their heart if there is a injury in the in the in the embryonic stage but they start losing that capability after they are born like humans but there are some fish like zebra fish is a kind of fish or many freshwater fish even if you cut their heart they will regenerate their cardiac muscles okay now striated muscles should not regenerate is the point mostly in humans so our muscles of the legs and the hands don't regenerate but the same muscles which are striated and voluntary in a amphibian like salamander regenerates so regeneration again is a very unique property that is present in some striated muscles in animal system but not present in others okay so one thing more you can write down cardiac muscles are are in extensive regulation as i told you we cannot control our heart at will ever so cardiac muscles are extensively under the control of nervous system even in cases where we we have myogenic heart so the myogenic means that the beating the rhythm will be set by the heart itself so even if you take out a human heart and keep it on a plate it will keep beating for some time okay because it's a myogenic heart myo means muscle genic means origin so it's the origin the rhythm originates from the muscles itself but it can only be regulated like increased or decreased by the brain and neurogenic hearts because the word says neurogenic they are completely under the control of their brain so even the rhythm is set by the brain so to to explain you in plain words organisms who have a neurogenic heart cannot go into a coma they directly die coma is a state where your brain is not responding to a lot of things but you are alive because your lungs and heart is working so humans can go under coma or can go under brain dead situations where heart and the lungs are working 
lungs mostly work on um, um, ventilators, artificial ventilators, because remember I told you in breathing and respiration that there is a pneumotaxic center in the brain, correct? Pons region that sets the rhythm of the lungs. So lung is still under to some extent under the control, to major extent under the control of nervous system, but heart can keep beating. So there is a dilemma in science, uh, in medical science, whether to whether to uh, take a brain dead person as a dead person, biologically dead person or not. So different countries have different rules on it. So in India, a brain dead is not considered dead. But in US, let's say in many European countries, a brain dead is considered dead because that's how they define. Okay, so yeah, so that's the difference. You only a myogenic heart consisting organism can be brain dead. Make sense, everyone? So these are the three types of muscles. In the next class, I'll stop here for today. In the next class, I'll be talking about uh, the uh, first the structure and second uh, there is a there is a filament theory in muscles. Fil move uh, filament. It's called um, the sliding filament theory. Thank you so much. It's called the sliding filament theory for the movement of muscles, where the actin and the myosin these are the two filaments which also independently in a cell constitutes the microfilaments that we were talking about. So they form filament, one filament slides over other and that's how muscles contract or relax using a lot of energy. So we will talk about it, how actin filament slide over myosin filament in the next class, which is going into the molecular uh, mechanism of muscle movement. Okay, so that we'll do in the next class. And Anyone has any doubts still here?